Okay. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. Um, super excited to be here. Quick shout out to the CFP committee. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak today. Uh, and thank you to, to all of you for making it back from lunch and uh, choosing this track. I see some fancy drinks. The, uh, the, the, uh, the bar is open, so if you need to go grab a drink, I can stall for a few minutes while, uh, while you freshen up there. So just a little bit about me. Um, to start things off, uh, as, as she mentioned, my name is Greg Longo. I am a uh, senior intrusion analyst at uh, CrowdStrike. I'm on the, uh, the Falcon Overwatch team, uh, spending time uh, hunting nation state adversaries. Uh, I've spent a considerable, a considerable amount of my time uh, hunting kitten targets, so I uh, think Iran Nexus adversaries. Um, but about eight to 10 months ago, um, started to get into some more Mac OS analysis. And uh, the, that work sort of drove me towards a different adversary, um, which we'll talk about today. Um, I thought this talk would be interesting because um, as it pertains to, to Chalimas uh, and Labyrinth Chalima, um, they've been in the news uh, quite a bit. I'm sure you've seen some headlines recently um, in regards to like the 3CX uh, supply chain breach, um, as well as uh, a more recent attack at, um, at Jump Cloud. Um, but, uh, but before we get started, I just want to take a quick poll to see uh, by a raise of hands, um, how many of you folks know that your organization deploys Macs across the enterprise uh, outside of just the security department? Handful? Okay. Um, and how many Mac admins do we have out here in the audience today? Anybody? Excellent. Well, okay. So you can keep me honest as I'm going through this. Um, so Today we're going to talk about some uh, some some case studies of uh, Labyrinth Chalima and some intrusions that we came across. Um, quick agenda: We'll go through who the adversary is, just to set the stage. Talk a little bit about uh, their tradecraft. We'll give you some information on how they target, who they're targeting, and then walk you through a day in the life. And that'll kind of take you through the interactive piece of the intrusions that that we've come across. So Labyrinth of Chalima, um, as CrowdStrike names them, uh, also called Lazarus Group or Hidden Cobra from the US government. Um, definitely one of the most prolific uh, D DPRK um, actors that's out there. They've been active since 2009, um, and they are uh, ideally part of the uh, Bureau 121 of the Reconnaissance General Bureau. So Reconnaissance General Bureau, um, for those that aren't familiar, is going to be the premier intelligence organization within uh, North Korea. In 2009, coincidentally, is when they stood up Bureau 121, which is their, uh, their CNO organization and the folks that conduct offensive cyber operations. So since 2009, Labyrinth Chalima has gone through this sort of arc of uh, operational remit. They started off early on just doing destructive kinds of attacks. Uh, think, you know, um, your wipers, uh, DDoS, um, defacing websites, things like that. Um, but by all standards now, pretty, pretty amateurish, but um, I guess that's where everybody's got to start. They gradually picked up um, your traditional intelligence collection mission. So they focused on uh, military targets um, across uh, basically South Korea, Japan, uh, the US. Uh, and then they also started to delve into your more uh, economic espionage as well. More recently, um, in tandem with their intelligence collection operations that they, that they conduct, they've also really um, picked up the, uh, the currency generation stuff. So uh, if any of you went to the, uh, the Crypto Bros talk that was in um, track two uh, just before lunch, um, you heard talk about APT38, which is um, a different uh, Chalima, but also part of this whole uh, effort to, to generate currency for the, uh, for the regime. Labyrinth Chalima is interesting because um, they are, um, aside from the other organizations within Bureau 121, um, they are responsible for more, some more of the, the really high profile attacks. So everybody's familiar with the, uh, the Sony um, hack in 2014. That was Labyrinth um, WannaCry um, 2017. That was also uh, Labyrinth Chalima as well. So, um, so these guys are, are, uh, are known for some of these, these bigger attacks that they've carried out. Over the last 18 months, um, 
some of the the, the uh, intrusions that we've come across, we've seen attacks in the, the financial technology, media, and tele telecommunications verticals. So um, that's really where they're where they're targeting uh, most recently. In terms of some of the tradecraft, um, they're really a well-resourced organization, uh, and we've been able to observe that given the fact that they've been able to take um, implant frameworks and tools that they have that initially work on Windows, uh, adapt them to Linux, adapt them to Mac OS, uh, and even go after mobile devices on the Android platform. So clearly, these guys, uh, they've got a, a broad range of um, operators as well as a, a well-resourced capability development organization. Um, we've seen them very quickly evolve implants that they have from one platform to, the, to another platform. So, you know, think uh, about 2018 timeframe is re really when they started going after uh, Mac devices, um, you know, the, uh, the Apple juice malware and, and things like that. Um, and then we've seen them rapidly evolve the implants that they have really from 2020 until now, um, where we've seen multiple iterations, adding new capabilities and new features um, uh, into, their, into their implants recently. <clears throat> so again, some more on targeting. Uh, and this really gets to the currency generation aspect of the operations that they are conducting, which is really where this, uh, um, this effort's sort of headed. Um, they've been able to steal uh, a significant amount of cryptocurrency over the last four years. Um, and this whole uh, currency generation effort is, is really um, intended, or really came out of the sanctions that have been, been constantly lev levied on North Korea, as well as um, economic struggles that they've endured uh, based on the, uh, you know, the pandemic. So um, from what I've read, uh, the pandemic really set them back. Um, you know, they, they suffered the largest economic loss they have in, in, I think, the last, like, 23 years, something like that. So they're really suffering for how do we bring uh, money back into, uh, into the regime um, and take care of our folks. Uh, across the, the intrusions that we've seen at, uh, at cryptocurrency and uh, technology organizations, uh, they've been able to really tailor the, the tools that they're using against the targets that they're going after. So this kind of goes back to uh, a bullet on the previous slide, which was uh, we see varying levels of complexity uh, in their tradecraft. And we've seen them use some very low sophistication stuff uh, against targets that maybe don't really have that big of an impact. Um, and if they're going after a larger target, something with a, maybe a larger financial gain, uh, a more strategic interest, uh, we've seen them take a bit more due diligence in, uh, one, how they're targeting, um, how they're luring uh, the victims, uh, and then basically how they deploy their implants. So um, one of the things that they, they are, are fond of are these multi-stage implants. So they'll, they'll send droppers out to basically assess a system um, without se sending a second stage or a third stage until they know that that's actually a system they want to be on. Um, and that's some, sort of what they do to kind of uh, maintain their OPSEC in some of these more um, strategic environments that they're in. Really, the primary goal for this currency generation, again, sort of alluded to in that Crypto Bros talk, uh, they want to find these private keys, anywhere they can find private key keys for crypto wallets so that they can then transfer those funds, launder that money, and then bring that into the, to, to their economy. So the landscape, uh, this talk is going to focus specifically on uh, their intrusions on Mac OS devices. Um, Again, macOS has been pretty interesting. Um, we've seen a, a noticeable uptick in the deployment of Mac devices across enterprise environments. Um, going back to 2021, um, Mac's accounted for 23% of the, uh, the enterprise market share. That's up 5% from, from two years earlier. So we see this drive of organizations letting um, users bring Macs in or deploying more Macs to folks in you know, the software development uh, arena or even leadership positions. So that's interesting because when we see who the Chalimas are targeting, Labyrinth Chalima in particular, it's going to be those individuals, really, software developers, uh, engineers, folks that have privileged access, 
um, folks that might have, um, or really anybody that might have a, uh, a crypto wallet um, available to them is really who they're going after uh, in this realm. We've also seen uh, a constant evolution in Mac malware. So similarly, we, you know, we saw Chalima's go from Windows to Linux to Mac. Um, we're seeing malware take on the same uh, uh, trajectory, right? Um, a lot of times the Mac malware that we've come across has been adapted from Windows. Um, and now we're seeing stuff that's specifically developed for the Mac platform because right? Uh, as, as the deployments increase in enterprises, they become more of a lucrative target, right? Which is why we haven't seen that in the past. So we're seeing some things like this, right? A lot of new uh, info stealers are coming out, things that are, again, tailored directly for the macOS platform. And then even um, what was in the news recently, Rust Bucket um, from Jamf, um, again, attributed to a Chalima, but that's stuff that's developed specifically for that platform because they're adapting their tools and their tradecraft for who they're targeting. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about a day in the life of a, of a DPRK operator. Uh, the time frame of these intrusions that we're gonna go through, we're gonna go through two examples that we have, is uh, basically late 2022 through early 2023. So these are, are relatively recent intrusions that we've come across. And this is where the adversaries deployed their Matanet implant. Uh, Matanet is uh, just one of the tools that they use. It's a, um, uh, a, a plug-in based implant where the initial payload has some initial capability to fingerprint a system, provide some inf information back to the adversary, uh, but then install additional plugins that give them more capabilities, things like uh, file system enumeration, um, process management, um, creating network tunnels and network proxies, and then most importantly, uh, archiving and exfilling information. So as we go through these intrusions, um, we're gonna show you as much of the interactive piece uh, that we came across on these Mac devices, um, but there is gonna be an element, and I'll try and talk to it, where we don't have visibility because something like exfil is gonna be accomplished directly through their implant, and we're not gonna be able to see that uh, in terms of a host-based artifact on the system, but what we do see is maybe a file getting created out of nowhere and then it gets sucked off, right? Um, so that's really uh, the way the Matinet implant works. And I probably won't go into any more detail uh, because I'm not uh, a malware guy, um, but, uh, but that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, two examples, like I said, one in the financial sector and then one in the technology sector. So across both of these intrusions, the initial access was gained through some pretty elaborate social engineering. Uh, that's really how Labyrinth Chalima goes about um, getting initial access on the systems. Um, and it's really, their ability to conduct social engineering is actually quite impressive. Um, they will, on the low end, send, you know, your typical uh, phishing uh, email with uh, a malicious PDF that's, uh, you know, a job description or, or that sort of thing, right? Really basic stuff all the way up to where we've seen them actually create um, fake companies. They'll create a website for a fake company. They'll create LinkedIn profiles uh, for personas, um, for employees that work at this fake company. And then they'll even uh, create fake applications. So we've seen them create uh, basically a fake crypto wallet um, that actually appears to semi-function uh, and then has some backdoor functionality built into it. So these guys go to pretty great lengths um, to establish credibility of themselves um, as they're targeting these users. Uh, and we tend to see a lot of targeting over um, LinkedIn. Uh, it's a pretty common um, method for them to reach out to, uh, to these individuals. And then what they'll even do is take conversations from LinkedIn uh, and move them over to, say, Skype or Telegram or some other uh, social media platform or other platform to communicate directly with the, uh, with the victim to get them to either download software or take an application or, or that sort of thing. And that's really intended to obviously get around any sort of uh, enterprise security devices um, or technology that might get in the way of like, you know, filtering things out on, on, on the way in, that, that sort of thing. Um, most recently, and this is uh, sort of interesting, we've actually seen them engage directly via text message um, with a victim too. So um, these guys really go out of their way to, to establish themselves and, and connect with their, with their targets. 
Okay, so intrusion number one, cryptocurrency organization. Let's talk about their, the installation uh, and some initial reconnaissance that, uh, that was conducted. Um, so the user that they targeted, um, they got them, um, we believe it was via uh, Skype phishing that they uh, got this user to download a malicious application called Payroll System. It was actually a, a, a Mac application um, that they delivered to them. The user executed it. And when they executed this application or tried to open this application, basically what it did was spawned a bash shell um, and then reached out using curl um, to grab the second stage uh, implant and then obviously made that, uh, made that executable. So what payroll system did was effectively run these, run these commands to string together using the NS task class um, within, the, within the OS. So it's interesting, we've got, you know, I've got two commands there listed next to bash, but we've got three commands up top. Um, and that's that last one, right? So that's their Safari agent. Um, that's their implant. So that gets executed at the end of, you know, running this payroll system uh, application. So basically what happens is Safari agent automatically executes. And then what that's going to do, spawn another bash shell and run some initial reconnaissance, right? So we can see them just enumerate the user's directory using your basic ls command. And then um, the, uh, the third line down, it's kind of interesting. So uh, we see them actually looking for some hidden file in that user's directory. Really didn't make sense when we initially saw them, saw them do that, but uh, it makes sense later on because what they're doing is effectively looking to see if their implant already exists on this host. And then swvers, which is basically the, uh, the, uh, the command to gather information about the, the operating system. Gives you the, the build, the name, things like that, so they know where they've landed. So they've got some initial information, they've done some initial recon, uh, obviously they want to establish persistence, so they take their Safari agent, and they run a few more commands that we're able to see because it's going to shell out. So they write two files um, using their implant. They write this uh, hidden file aws-cli and npm-audit. So a couple things that are interesting about those files, right? One, they're purportedly, they try and make them blend into the environment, right? So they, AWS CLI looks legit if you were to see that name. NPM audit also looks legit, NPM being that package repository. Um, so those file names sort of look like they could belong. However, uh, at the root of a user's directory um, isn't typically where you're going to find executable files like that. Um, and they're hidden files too. So. Uh, you know, a couple of those things stand out. They, they basically execute those, uh, those files um, as a daemon to, uh, to get them running, and then they start doing some more reconnaissance of the file system. So they look in this, uh, this PostgreSQL um, directory, and um, they find a place where they want to land another, uh, another binary for them. So they take their NPM audit, and then they move that over, and they name it PSQL tool. So if you guys are probably familiar with uh, Postgres, um, there is a PSQL uh, binary that exists. That's legit, but not a PSQL tool binary. Again, attempting to blend into their environment. Um, so they move it over, and then they write this plist file. So a plist file, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, is basically a, it's a property list file. It's what uh, it's what Mac uses um, to, um, it's, it's an XML file to capture information about um, daemons and processes that they want to execute. Uh, they take a look at that plist, make sure it looks okay, um, and this is what it looks like. So a couple interesting things to point out from here. That might be a bit of an eye chart, apologize, but um, what you'll notice uh, about halfway down the screen, there's a label key. Basically, it's going to tell um, launch D um, what to call this if someone were to query the system to say, you know, what, what launch agents or launch daemons do I have running? Um, you're going to see the name of it right there. Again, intended to sort of blend into the environment. Um, they've got uh, launch only once set as true, which uh, it didn't really make sense to us 
why they're doing that, but it could be um, trying to avoid detection. Basically, what that's going to do is that's going to say, run this once. Um, if, if the process dies, don't try and restart it. Um, the program, um, that's also very important. So that's what's actually going to be executed. So there you can see the line where they're executing PSQL tool, which is their implant. So a little bit about macOS persistence. Uh, there's a number of ways uh, to establish persistence on Mac. Uh, launch agents and launch daemons um, are one of the, the more common methods you'll see out there. So launch D is basically your, uh, your system um, manager. Um, it's the first thing that gets started right after the kernel starts up. So it usually has uh, PID1. And then what that will do is it will start any launch daemons that are going to be applied system-wide. So uh, launch daemons apply to any, system, any user that logs into the system and will be running every time that system boots. You also have launch agents, which are specific to uh, individual users. So launch agents won't actually be started until a particular user where that launch agent is associated logs into the system. These things exist uh, in various places across the operating system. So you have uh, Apple provided daemons and, and agents. Those are going to be in system library, launch daemons and launch agents. Um, and those are going to be protected. There's, um, those are protected by the, uh, by the by SIP and, and the file system. You've got root level ones that are provided typically by third parties and, app and uh, software that, that uh, you'll install again, at the root of library. And then you've got user-defined launch agents. And those are obviously in the user uh, library launch agents directory. All right, so going back to uh, what the adversary is doing in terms of reconnaissance and exfiltration. So using the Safari agent, this is where a bit of the, the exfiltration gets, um, gets fuzzy for us. Um, we see them run a few commands, netstat, ps, basically check to see, is their implant running? Um, do, you know, do they have what they need? Um, they run the DSCL command. So DSCL is the directory, directory services command line utility. Think, um, think of like your net group, um, you know, those, those kinds of reconnaissance tools on, or uh, activities on Windows. And uh, so what they've done is they've dumped a whole bunch of information from the user's profile straight into this, uh, this hidden file in the temp directory. And that's effectively what we saw them uh, exfilling um, once they were done running these recon commands. OK. So we'll jump into intrusion two. Again, let's talk about installation. So this one's a bit more interesting because uh, we didn't actually see where this one came from. We presume, again, um, you know, probably a social engineering vector in. Um, but where we initially saw execution was through, the, through a malicious uh, Jamf script. So the technology organization used Jamf to manage, manage their, their Mac endpoints. Um, and within one of the scripts that got executed, we saw it, it actually looked like a legit script that was modified by the actor um, to add a few extra commands at the end so that when, you know, when the script got run, it would do some, some extra things for them. So we've got this, uh, this shell script that runs. And basically what they do again is they run curl to pull down their uh, second stage from, uh, from their own uh, infrastructure, uh, set that executable, and then launch it again as a daemon. Similar to you know the last intrusion that we talked about and other intrusions that we've seen, um, they named this this implant Jamf D, which at first glance you're going to look at that and say, "Yep, sure, we use Jamf, so Jamf D, um, it's a daemon um, that makes sense." Uh, but again, running out of slash temp um, isn't where you'd expect to see that running from. So again, they want to establish persistence, so they execute Jamf D. Jamf D is going to actually write another binary. And this is something interesting that we've seen Labyrinth Chalima do. Um, and we're not sure if it's different operators that are coming in or uh, if they're just testing different uh, TTPs. But we've seen them write multiple copies of their implant. They'll write an implant, they'll run it, 
they'll stop it, they'll remove it, they'll write another copy, put it somewhere else, run it. Um, and so it's not really clear what they're trying to achieve by doing that. Um, but you'll see in this scenario where they run multiple variations of their implant. So they write another implant called Adobe Agent. They write it, it's sitting there. They spawn a bash shell and they use their, their launch daemon uh, persistence mechanism again. So they write this plist file um, and then they use launch control. So launch control is basically the command line utility to interface with the launch D um, service manager. Um, so they use launch control load, load that plist. And effectively what that's gonna do is it's gonna take what's in that plist and that program argument, if you recall, and it's gonna execute that. So this is what the plist looks like this time. You can see again, middle of the screen, there's a label, com.adobe.armdc, blah, blah, blah. That's what launch D is gonna recognize as the, uh, the service. And then you can see they're running the program, uh, user local bin Adobe agent, which is where they stash their implant this time. So now Adobe agent runs. Thankfully, Adobe agent is gonna shell out as well. And we're gonna see some additional reconnaissance. Um, and what you'll notice, uh, and you probably know from if any of you who are using Macs, um, is a lot of these commands, um, well, a lot of them carry over from Linux, right, given the, the underpinnings of Mac OS, and then some of them are unique. So running uname, who am I, if config, get some network information. Then they run their SWVers again to see what system they're on. Um, they run that netstat command again, right, and this is something interesting. So whenever we see them run that netstat command, if you happen to pick up on that in you know a few slides ago, um, they like that annotation for some reason. Netstat, ANVP, TCP is what they tend to always run. Um, so you see, we see something like that, um, and that kind of clues us in like, you know, this, you know, who, who is the target, where are we seeing this, what context are we seeing it in, um, and that could be interesting. This time they enumerate some, um, some sensitive files in the user's directory, so looking at um, their Z shell history file to see maybe what that, that uh, user's been executing, um, looking at, uh, looking for SSH uh, keys that they can use. Um, so again, trying to find avenues to, to harvest credentials, uh, possibly uh, engage in lateral movement, um, things like that. They run their DSCL command. Interestingly, they run it once, it doesn't work. The operator had typo, so they run it again um, and then redirect their output again to another hidden file in slash temp. So we can kind of see some of their, their TTPs uh, replaying over and over in this sense. So now they go about persistence again, apparently, in this case. Uh, so Adobe Agent writes another implant, an, another, another file. Um, they name it something different. They locate it in another place on the file system. And they make that executable. Now they run their new implant again, and it shells out. And they uh, update their, um, their plist file to now use um, a, different, uh, a different implant. So they move uh, Adobe Agent to this other file called com.adobe ARM ARMDC jobless daemon. So you remember before they actually had um, a plist file with that name. Um, so now they've moved um, Adobe Agent there using this other implant, right? And uh, we're not sure if they're trying to do that, to, again, to blend in. Um, maybe they were concerned that um, the previous one would have stood out under scrutiny, things like that. So, um, so they, take, they take upon themselves to, to establish this other persistence. This one's a bit more interesting. Uh, so plist hijacking, again, they run their, their implant. And we'll step through this one because um, there's a few lines to it. So just after creating the previous plist, renaming their implant you know, to something else um, and persisting, they now move their jobless helper uh, executable to, or excuse me, they take, uh, SM jobless helper, uh, which is a legitimate binary, and they move it to jobless help. So they rename that, take a legit binary, move it over, 
They look for it. It's good. They set their uh, binary to executable. And then they load their plist file again. So think the previous slide where they had that plist. Um, that plist was legit and going to execute the jobless helper binary. Now it's going to execute their implant. They decide to unload that. And they take jobless helper, which is their implant, and they move it to jobless helper underscore. Then they take jobless help, right, which was a legit binary that they set aside, and they move that back to SM jobless helper. Again, not sure if they're thinking, um, you know, basically what, what that binary does. I believe is checks when you run an Adobe a piece of Adobe software checks to make sure it's legit, licensed, that sort of thing. So maybe they thought, hey, if someone goes to fire up a, a piece of Adobe software and this, this thing tries to run, they may question it, they may look into it, they may find us. So let's move that one back. So they move that back. So now Jobless Helper is the legit binary, and their implant is named Jobless Helper underscore. So now they look at another service, legit service, on the, on the system, uh, legit executable, this uh, Adobe GC client, uh, AGS service. So they take that one, AGS service, and they move it to AGS services. Okay, so they take, the, again, the legit binary, set it aside to something else. Now they move their SM jobless helper underscore, which again is their implant file, move that over to AGS service. So they've effectively taken that legit binary and replaced it with their implant file at this time, right? And now we see them look to see, make sure it's there, it's good. Um, they, they modify the permissions a little bit. And then they load the AGS service plist. So that AGS service plist is actually a legit plist, right? Which, um, when the system starts up, because it's a launch daemon, is going to launch that legit AGS service. So now what they've done is they've taken that legit plist and they've just put their binary, you know, in, in place of where that executable should load. So what this looks like to me is uh, what I call plist hijacking. Um, and they can they executed all these commands in less than five minutes. So they kind of knew where they were going, what they were looking at. Um, it, it felt a bit like they were fumbling around a little bit, but um, but that's where they landed and that's that's where they left things in terms of persistence. So some of the analysis hurdles that we come across when looking at these uh, uh, the, like Mac platforms, right, is that a lot of the activity can be very low footprint. Um, and when you have low footprint activity, uh, especially on a Mac, which is an extremely noisy operating system, it can be sometimes difficult to determine how much of this is admin uh, activity, how much of it is a legit user activity, what's really uh, an actor. So you really need to understand what the system should be doing, understand that baseline, um, and have a general understanding of, of the executables and what you're running on, on your Macs to know what, what should stand out. Again, there's a lot of use of data binaries, which we're all very familiar with, the living off the land. Um, clearly, that's something that, uh, that Labyrinth Shalima takes advantage of, makes use of um, when they're doing their reconnaissance and things like that. We saw that they've uh, tailored a number of their files to blend into the environment. So um, you combine low footprint activity with a lot of files that you may not be familiar with, with names that look legit, um, for services that should be there. Um, all this stuff sort of complicates the analysis that, that you're going through. Process lineage is a, is a very difficult thing um, from an EDR perspective on Mac. Um, and it's important because, you know, if you see reconnaissance commands being run, but you don't understand what the parent process is, um, or you see a parent process and you don't understand who the grandparent is, um, those, can, those things can all challenge your, the context that you're trying to develop around the activity that you're seeing. And then system irregularities. Um, again, I mentioned macOS is a very noisy operating system. Um, I also pointed out that there are these places where you put launch agents and launch daemons, things where third-party applications should put them, places where users can put them. Um, 
but really you can do whatever you want, right? And so you're going to find things scattered across the file system. Um, you're going to find files where you don't believe there should be files, um, executables where normally executables don't reside. Um, so again, it can be very challenging to understand what does normal look like um, when you've got this um, variety of activity on, on the systems that, that doesn't really make sense. Okay, and uh, I'll leave you with a pretty bland and uh, unimpressive conclusion slide. Um, so obviously, the threat landscape is evolving, right? Um, we're seeing a lot more um, uh, effort and resources being devoted to the Mac platform. And again, we're tying that to the fact that we're seeing more and more uh, enterprises deploy Macs, again, particularly in, in departments where you've got software developers or system administrators, folks with privileged access, uh, as well as leadership positions um, in the organization. So as Macs continue to make their way into the enterprise, this is a trend that's going to continue where users are gonna, or not users, excuse me, adversaries are gonna devote more and more effort to, to targeting those systems. Um, and then a generic people process technology. So like, how do you defend, if you are deploying Macs, how do you defend the fleet of Macs that you have out there? Um, do you have analysts that understand and can analyze intrusion activity on a Mac? Do you have the technology deployed to those devices where you can actually gain the visibility of what's happening on the endpoint? Um, and uh, you know, do you have a process in place for, you know, again, conducting that analysis, performing response, remediation, um, all those kinds of activities. So these all sort of, you know, uh, the challenges with, with Max play uh, against the organization. Um, and so these are going to be important things to keep in mind um, heading off into the future. Pending any questions? Uh, that's all I had. Oh, excellent hands. Yes, sir. Uh, that's interesting. Probably a bit out of my wheelhouse to be able to comment on uh, on their relationship. Um, what I can say is, um, uh, you know, we have come across Chinese APT uh, intrusions on macOS going back to again like uh, 2017, 2018 timeframe. It's hard to say if they're sharing um, any of that stuff with the North Koreans, um, but. Uh, yeah, I would. It would be pure speculation at this point, and uh, I probably I probably couldn't give you a good answer. Out of curiosity, any recent insights? Oh, thank you. Much better. So, any insights in terms of have you seen uh, North Korean attributed threat actors using past the hash exploits? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to comment on anything outside of the Mac systems because that's where I spent my time. So um, what, what I will say, though, is that, again, Labyrinth Lima is extremely capable. Um, they are well resourced. Um, and outside of Labyrinth Lima, we have, we as in CrowdStrike, right, have a handful of other Chalimas uh, named adversaries. Um, and those are folks that I haven't spent a whole lot of time looking at uh, in any great detail. But um, my guess would be they, they have those capabilities and can use them when they want. Yep. Thank you. Once again, that was a great walkthrough. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question about the Adobe. So when after they um, change the name of the original program, add an S or an underscore, um, and then they use their implant, change it to the uh, true name, right? right? They don't delete the original program. They leave it there. And doesn't that kind of leave a fingerprint that they've been there 
And do you have any ideas of why they wouldn't take that like final step of removing that yeah. legitimate program? It, yeah, it, it definitely does. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, with that uh, SM jobless helper uh, executable that they removed and then replaced, maybe because they didn't want to get detected, uh, at the same time, this, this AGS, AGS service or whatever it was, right, has now been set aside. So if that goes to execute, um, you know, theoretically, they, you know, uh, uh, an administrator or somebody who's looking may determine that, like, hey, this isn't working the way it should. Um, I think that is an artifact that they left behind. I don't really know why they did that. I don't know if it's a sort of evolving tradecraft that they have. Again, we've seen them, we've, we've seen them start targeting Max in 2018. So they've had some time to, you know, to understand how to operate on a system. But we also uh, recognize that they have different levels of operators. Um, we've seen different um, uh, behaviors ac across different MAC intrusions. So what that tells us is they may have a group that maybe really understands what they're doing, um, and another group that uh, doesn't quite have the same playbook. Um, so uh, to answer your question, yep, le leaving that uh, that legit binary that has been renamed, leaving that on the system, um, is definitely something that could that could it is a giveaway for them. I, I have a follow up real quick. Sure. Um, so it, look, it looks like that you know a lot of this is automated, right? They got they basically copy and paste a lot of their bash script and stuff like that. Is there also a possibility that they're leaving it behind um, for a later version of their malware to test? If the program starts to run incorrectly due to patching or something, it can switch later. So if they keep it there for the moment, they can take away until it calls back for an update of their own malware. Is that possible? Have you ever seen anything like that? We have not. We have not seen anything like that. I would say probably anything's within the realm of possibility for these guys. Um, we've also heard um, anecdotally that um, so obviously they've got um, a very prominent currency generation mission. Um, we've also heard that maybe they are. Um, partly initial access uh, operations where they're going to get in, they're going to recon a system, they're going to exfil stuff that they need, and then it could be, say, uh, a silent Chalima or a Stardust Chalima or another Chalima that will come in on the back end and use the access that they already have to then carry out additional um, actions on objective, right? So leaving behind implants may be something that they uh, intend to do for that reason, um, or it could just be sloppy on their part. I love the questions. It's good. Question. Hey, thank you. Um, have you seen anything specific to Mac OS in terms of covering tracks or anti forensics that these groups are using? Uh, in terms of anti forensics, um, I would have to say no. We have we have not. Uh, not in the traditional sense like we've seen on Windows and Linux systems. Um, in terms of clearing logs or replacing log files or anything like that. They haven't gone to any great lengths that we've seen. Um, one thing that I will say is that um, a lot of the implants that these guys are using um, provide the ability to run commands through the implant and provide the ability to shell out, as we've seen. And so when they run commands natively via their implant, those are things that we don't have visibility of. Um, so. There's, I'll make a general caveat that um, that I, I know there are commands that they are running. There's things that they're doing that we just don't see. And we know that based on the activity. Like if we were to uh, basically timeline all of the hands-on activity that we're seeing, there are gaps in it. And there are things that sort of appear out of nowhere that we understand from our malware uh, folks, you know, the implants have the capability to execute commands and do certain things. So we have to sort of make an analytical leap and say, um, you know, hey, this, you know, they run these commands and all of a sudden a zip file appears. Um, we're going to say that they're using their implant to, to archive because we don't see them running anything else to, to create a zip file. Um, so whether they're doing any anti forensics with their implant, I can't really, I can't really say for sure. But, but on the command line, we have not seen anything traditional uh, anti-forensics. 
Just uh, I had uh, uh, two questions for you. Uh, <clears throat> the first part is uh, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Circle CI breach from earlier this year, or I guess at tail end last year. It sounds like what you're describing here. So it, it, basically, a developer workstation was breached. It was a Mac OS. They used Access on there to steal credentials and so on. Um, I'm curious if you think that may have the fingerprints of uh, a North Korean APT. And, and then the, my second part of the question is, I'd really love to run some purple team exercises on these. Are there some resources available where I can kind of like download and, and the same information that you presented here today? Thank you. I guess I would answer the first question with yes. Um, and the second question, um, so Circle CI, yet yeah, there's definitely some fingerprints of Lab and the Chalima um, in the activity that we saw. Um, and what we've seen from the data and the reports that have been released on Circle CI. Uh, in terms of open source resources, um, I don't know of any offhand. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this presentation was because, again, Chalimas have been in the news, um, but a lot of what I've been reading have been, hey, here's an implant or here's a malicious file and here's kind of what it does, um, as opposed to what does the adversary look like uh, when they're on the keyboard? What are the commands that they're running? How are they running them? Um, that sort of thing. Um, so in terms of recreating stuff, um, maybe we could talk uh, offline after this, but um, I, I don't know of any good repositories of the, the hands-on component of this that, that's out there. Yeah. There, was a, there was a question. Oh, I'm sorry, you've been very patient. In terms of... Yep. So um, I guess short answer is no, because um, so uh, maybe I should have mentioned at the outset, all of this stuff that we've got is from um, our sensor. And um, we don't see, we can see XFIL basically up to the point where we believe it leaves the system. So, um, you know, Lab with Chalima is known to reuse infrastructure. So um, the C2s, uh, the domains that they're using, they are they will go to great lengths to establish some OPSEC up front, right, where they say, you know, here's a dropper. Um, let me give you stage one, see if that's a system I want to be on before I drop stage two or stage three and burn those, those binaries. Um, but once they do that, then they don't really care that they've been found, right? To go back to the other gentleman's question, they leave stuff behind. Um, they reuse years later um, the same infrastructure. Um, and so I feel like once they've, once they've landed on a target, um, at that point, they don't care if the finger gets pointed back to them. Um, so, so we don't really see exactly where that exfil is going. Um, what I can say is that in terms of the Matinet implant that we've seen, um, the Matinet implant has gone through evolutions um, and improvements um, and the different variations that we've seen. We've seen the exfil from that implant be consistent in the artifacts that it leaves on the host, um, which has been beneficial to us from a hunting perspective. Um, but that's really, that's really as far as we can go to say what consistencies are there and, and how they exfil. Yeah. Um, due to time constraint, uh, Greg will take uh, the rest of the questions offline. Thank you, Greg. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.